News Talk, 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. The views and opinions of the following show do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of News Talk 1450 WOL, Radio 1 Incorporated, or their management. You are now tuned in to Talk with Sheba with your host, Dr. Sheba Holly. We invite, excite, educate, and empower. Let's talk. Welcome to Talks with Sheba, the place where real people give real answers on issues plaguing our community today. Hi, I'm your host, Dr. Sheba Holly. Thanks for joining us this Super Sunday. We aim to invite, excite, educate, and empower. So let's talk. Let's talk about fatherless daughters. Today, we have Kristen Mitchell here, the author of He Wasn't My Daddy. Kristen, welcome to Talks with Sheba. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I mean, you're a Washingtonian. I am. That's very rare. Born and raised. <laughs> <laughs> That's very rare. But it's, it's what I like about it is you're here in a city where this is an epidemic for girls. Absolutely. I think this is an epidemic everywhere. Yeah, it definitely is. But here you are making a difference. I'm trying. You're reaching out. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Well, as you said, I'm a Washingtonian. I left D.C. for about four years to live in Atlanta, where I attended Spelman, and I studied education there. Upon returning, I began my career uh, as a teacher, and so that's what I spend my days doing, educating our youth. Um, in the process of living life, I became severely depressed, and that was as a result of a relationship gone bad. And um, during that time, I sought out to figure out why I was so depressed and so distraught um, over this relationship. And what I realized was that I was missing the presence of a father that I never had. Mm -hmm. And so I began to write and journal and try and do a lot of soul searching regarding what my issues were and how deep my issues ran. And in that process, I birthed He Wasn't My Daddy, uh, the title of my memoir. Mm -hmm. And I open up my memoir with what I think is a very powerful statement. And I'll read a quick excerpt for Please you. Please do. Yes. <clears throat> Subconsciously, I longed for a father, never knowing I was longing for a father. I was his baby. He took me under his wing and protected me. He was never supposed to hurt nor lie to me. I had high expectations of him. He was supposed to be my daddy, my family the one man in my life that would love and protect me forever. He was supposed to cherish me and put me first. I trusted him completely, giving him my all and removing all barriers surrounding my heart because he said he would never hurt or forsake me. Daddies don't do that to their little girls. However, there was just one little problem. He wasn't my daddy. And I, I really love that excerpt from my book. I think it's very powerful, and I think it speaks to uh, when we as women put so much into a man. Mm -hmm. right who's not our biological father and we have those same expectations of that man that we should have of our father but if your father wasn't present and you don't know what the traditional role of a father should be mm -hmm. then you kind of look for and search for those qualities in someone that you become engaged in an intimate relationship with so that was the premise for the book so what it sounds like you're saying is this person you're talking about, he wasn't your father. So you were lacking your biological father and then later on lost your pseudo-father. Exactly. The, the one that took his place. Yeah, and, and it was a very subconscious act, right? I think a lot of times as adults we do things that we aren't even consciously aware that we're doing, you know? Um, and my father was incarcerated when I was a child and he was in, in prison for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so I was about 14, 15 when he came home. And by that time, you know, I thought I was grown and I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, think that I needed a father because I had gone without one for so long. And so naturally when he came home, we didn't have a relationship. You know, uh, he lived about 10, 15 minutes away from my mother and I, but we never really fostered that relationship. Okay. And so I think it left a lot of broken pieces within me that I did not realize were there. And it took me writing this to really realize, oh, Kristen, you have issues with the fact that your father wasn't there. Well, did you feel bitter? Or, you know, did you feel like, oh, well, since you didn't have time for me, now I don't have time for you? Uh, what was it? I didn't really feel bitter, to be honest. I genuinely didn't know that I cared. And it took me um, 
four psychiatric war visits, um, attempts at suicide. It took all of those things for me to really be reflective enough to say, Kristen, you have an issue with the fact that your father wasn't in your life, you know, and while that is not the root of all of my problems, it certainly is something that I cannot ignore, right? right? And so that's why I, I wanted to really speak to that heavily in the book. And, um, you know, it, it was it's very unfortunate. And, and what we find is that a lot of women who don't have that relationship with their father, they do search for a certain level of acceptance uh, from men in their lives, even if, if we do it, again, very subconsciously. And so I wanted to really bring this, this platform um, to life and so that we can have open dialogue about it within our communities. Did you ever speak to your mother about your feelings? Uh, no, not really. Uh, not until it, they surfaced, right? And so at that point, uh, we went to therapy and, and we spoke about those particular issues that I had with, with my father. My father and I actually went to therapy as well to speak about some of the issues that we had. And, and I mentioned that in my book. I think the beauty of the book is that it comes full circle. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just this depressing story where, you know, I'm saying, woe is me. I talk about, um, and, and that's why the subtitle is My Road to Restoration and Redemption, because I talk about how I was able to see myself out of the depression and out of the hurt and out of the pain. And so I speak more so about how uh, my father and I are on the men. And it's a struggle. It's not a perfect relationship by any means. Mm -hmm. um, but we do make an attempt to some degree to kind of try and rectify the wrongs that were made in the past. Definitely, definitely. So your platform, could you give a description of what your platform looks like at this time? Absolutely. So my platform is really meant to inspire, encourage, and uplift women, right? And so in that, I want to talk to women about the things that I myself have, have struggled with and, and overcome. And so the biggest thing that I speak about is mental illness, depression in particular. Um, I suffer from severe depressive disorder for years, and I was clinically diagnosed. And as I stated earlier, I was hospitalized about four different times, and I attempted suicide about two different times. And so when I encounter women who are battling with that same illness, because it is, in fact, an illness, I definitely want to spend my time speaking with them, encouraging them, and uplifting them as much as possible. So depression, mental illness is definitely a huge part of what it is that I do in terms of outreach and in terms of my platform. The next piece is self-esteem, which I think is critical because a lot of a lot of people suffer from self-esteem issues even without knowing or realizing that they suffer mm -hmm. from that as an issue, right? And so sometimes you'll see that lead into depression, you know, and I like to think of it as a domino effect, you know, one thing kind of um, ultimately and inevitably affects the other. And so those two things are huge. And then, of course, the fatherless daughters piece. So those are the three main prongs of, you know, what I do when I speak to women, when I conduct workshops and things of that nature. And so I tailor it to make sure it's appropriate for the audience. So you are the quintessential teacher. I am. <laughs> I like to think of myself as such. And we spoke a little off air, and, you know, I was telling you how it's very interesting. I've always wanted to be a teacher. Everyone who truly knows Chris, that's what I'm affectionately known as, mm -hmm. they know that I've always wanted to be a teacher. When I graduated from high school, I went to Spelman. I studied elementary education. I left Spelman, went to George Mason, and I received my Master's of Education in Special Education. And I've been teaching since I left um, undergrad. And so I was telling a friend of mine, I said, um, I said, Lauren, I'm confused. I said, I, I think God told me that I'm supposed to be a teacher, but I don't understand why now. I don't want to teach in the classroom. I want to just um, mentor women and have workshops with women and encourage them. And she said, Chris, that is teaching. Like, Absolutely. That's what teaching is about. You don't have to be in the classroom to teach. So um, I'm definitely working to do more of that, and I really enjoy doing that. That's fantastic, and it, it's good that someone could look in and help you realize that you're not betraying the profession. You're not betraying what you thought was your calling. You are stepping to your calling. Absolutely. It's just in a different way. Yes. Yeah. That's phenomenal. You know, um, I just, it, it, it's just hard to describe what I'm thinking right now because it, it's like you said, everything comes full circle. Yeah. Totally. Everything comes full circle. You probably played school when you were little. Oh my God, I did. <laughs> <laughs> 
my great grandmother. I was sitting in her kitchen, and at the time, I was the only child. My brother didn't come along until a little later, and so I was sitting in the kitchen. Mom was at work, and I was the teacher, right? And then I had imaginary pupils, and so they were the <laughs> students, and I would create worksheets for them to do as a teacher. And then, because I was the only child at the time, I would become the student, and I would complete the worksheets. Oh, that's And then hilarious. I would transform back into the teacher and grade the worksheets. Okay, <laughs> so. okay. You are definitely the teacher. <laughs> I am. Well, still to come, hopeless, like a penny with a hole in it. Up next. We all know that a good man is hard to find. And when it comes to finding a good handyman, that can be even more... 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. You are now tuned in to Talks with Sheba. I'm your host, Dr. Sheba Holly. We have Kristen Mitchell with us on fatherless girls, depression, and suicide. So, Kristen, you were hopeless. I was, absolutely. And um, it was a really rough time that spanned it for about six years. Hmm. A very long road. Yeah. You know, and every time I thought that I was getting it together, I would fall apart again. Wow. Right, but I had an amazing support system, um, and still do. You know, my family, my friends, they have been absolutely wonderful, and I most certainly would not be able to um, overcome any of what I've endured without them. So. Oh, so you said you were in and out of mental institutions. Yeah, and, and I couldn't understand why. You know, I hear was... I graduated from Spelman. This is my life story, I'm going to tell you, right? So <laughs> I graduated from Spelman, like, at the top of my class. I think I was ninth or tenth in my class, right? Um, magna cum laude, 3.91 GPA, mm. um, job of my dreams. I just wanted to teach. So <laughs> here I am right out of college with a job. Um, bought my house at 20. Three, twenty-two, twenty-three. Wow. Um, just, you know, I was, I was good. And so when I started falling apart, this was just like so off course from what I had anticipated for my life. And I felt like I was letting my mother down. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was letting my family down because I just couldn't pull it together. And I felt like I owed them more than what I was exhibiting. But what I didn't know at the time was that. Um, all of that was very intentional and all of that was very purposeful and mm -hmm. it led for me to be able to do this right right I wouldn't have this platform and I wouldn't be here speaking with you um, I would not have had all of the amazing successes that I've had had I not endured that time so you said you were diagnosed with clinical depression yes ma'am so what was happening to you I mean it, it, did it creep up on you did you oh Oh, it's, just a, it's a rainy day, so I feel down. What excuses were you making? A lot of time when, when people are diagnosed with depression, um, it's triggered by an event, right? And so for me, that triggering event was a breakup. Sounds very simple, sounds like things that happen every day. And um, I never, you know, put down my ex or shamed my ex. He was a great guy. But I just could not handle the uh, the, the breakup. I couldn't handle the loss. And for mm -hmm. me, it was a loss. For me, um, I felt abandoned, right? And so no matter how many times I tried to get myself back together after that relationship ended, I just couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so two years after we broke up, I found myself at the psych ward for the first time. Okay. And, and, and one would think that, you know, after two years, certainly you would move forward. But I just, I could not. And that's why I needed to find out why this breakup was so crippling. And that's how He Wasn't My Daddy came about. And so when I read the excerpt in the very beginning of our conversation, I spoke to how I yearned for my ex to fulfill a role that was not his role to fulfill. And so that was at the crux of why I felt so attached, so um, needy when it came mm -hmm. to him. Um, a lot of people ask me, Kristen, what does it feel like to be depressed? Or, you know, a lot of people confuse depression with sadness. Right. And depression and sadness are not one and the same. And so I'm going to read another excerpt for you, and um, hopefully this can kind of sum up what depression may feel like. Fantastic. Miss Has It All Together was literally falling apart, unbathed, improperly dressed, her mat hair matted to her scalp because it hadn't been combed. 
sitting on any low-level surface, Indian style, with hands in my lap, bowed head, a steady back and forth motion, accompanied with an uninterrupted hum that went on for extended periods of time. I could not think, nothing made sense. I just knew heaven was better than earth. So I didn't understand why God was ignoring my request to take me away from earth and allow me to escape the torture and simply dwell with him in heaven. Anything would have been better than where and how I was currently living. Um, that particular excerpt, you know, people are very surprised to hear that I was living like that. You know, um, I didn't shower for days on end sometimes. Mm. Um, I could only eat. I ate a lot. And so um, I gained a, a, a lot of weight, you know, during that time. Um, I would sit in the dark, and that was very comforting to me. I would sit in the dark, on the floor, cry, rock back and forth, um, almost in a trance. Mm. And so um, everything around me just felt wrong. I felt like I was in a world all by myself. Um, and no matter how many people were around, no matter how many people told me they loved me and told me they cared, I still felt very alone. And I felt like uh, the only way to escape the pain was to cease to live. And so that for me is what depression felt like. And what I learned during that time is that no matter what you've gone through, no matter what events triggered those feelings, um, it, you, you can't um, belittle those, those events for people. When I was in the first psychiatric ward, um, there was a woman there because she had lost her job. And some people will say, well, people lose their jobs every day. You know, that's nothing to be depressed about. Mm -hmm. But I learned that, you know, the way that you may respond to uh, a mishap in your life may not be the way that someone else responds to that same mishap. And so we have to exhibit a certain level of compassion and empathy for people when they're going through these times because we don't know what could trigger another person. Um, so I, because I've experienced this, I, I really enjoy speaking with women who are experiencing the same thing because I figured out a way to get myself through it. Um, my, my therapist and I, she's amazing, <clears throat> Dr. Green, we sat down and we talked and I said, okay, let me think back to how I was able to kind of pull myself through some of these difficult times, you know. Um, and I came up with this tool and I realized that I had to accept change or challenge the cognitive distortions that were in my head so mm -hmm. the tool i came up with is called ac squared and so again that was accept change or challenge and so for anyone who's going through any sort of, of unfortunate life circumstance or event we tend to look at the negative um of those events and and we create these distortions in our heads which are just unrealistic pictures of what things what things are and so I learned how to challenge those distortions or change altogether those distortions because distortions are just that. They're twisted pictures. They're not real. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So it, this breakup, mm -hmm. what was it? Why did you feel abandoned? Um, I think when you, <clears throat> when you subconsciously place so much on a person and you put them on a pedestal and then they fall for whatever reason, you don't really leave room for them to fall because you've placed them up so high, right? You you thought that they would never disappoint you. You thought that they would never leave. And so for me, when the relationship ended, I was shocked because I did not think that the relationship would ever end. I thought that it was a relationship that would carry on forever. And so when something is taken away from you or when something changes that you never saw coming, it can be a blow, you know. Um, it, it, it's like a death. And my mom had to explain to me that, Kristen, it's like it's a loss. Yeah, it's grieving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I didn't know that. I'm very black or white in my thinking. So for me, when she's like, it's a loss, I'm like, no, it's not. He's still alive. <laughs> no. So, <laughs> you know, but, you know, not being able to be in that relationship with this person who, you know, I grew very fond of. I actually liked him. You know, I didn't just love him. I really did like him as a person. So, you know, when that relationship is, is ended, I didn't know what to do with myself. I thought, well, God, like, what? Did you blame yourself? yourself? Absolutely. I think a lot of women, unfortunately, go through that. You know, we say uh, if, if I were more attractive, if I, um, I don't know, if I listened more, if I, um, 
was cater to his needs more or whatever it is that we think we didn't do mm -hmm. if we did that more then maybe this relationship would not have ended but what I did learn was that you know and this was me challenging those cognitive distortions that Kristen although he's a great man he simply just was not the man for you uh -huh. And that was, you know, and as hard as that, even today, that's very difficult sometimes for me. But I've just learned how to accept, there's that A, I've learned how to accept that that is my reality when it comes to that situation. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, we're going to talk more about our relationships with our fathers and how that impacts the relationships we have with men mm -hmm. in general. So up next, I hurt. Therefore, I am a dumping ground. I can make an impact in the world. As young people think that we can't make a difference, but not only we can make a difference, but sometimes we can make the biggest difference. We wanted to be the doers and we wanted to be the changers. You just have to find something that you're passionate about and use your talents and your abilities to volunteer. Volunteering doesn't have to be a chore. It really is a reward in itself. It helps you get farther in life. There is no better feeling than helping somebody else. You could see one person smile. You could tell they needed that smile, and it could really change and open up your heart to new things. A lot of things are really competitive about individual achievement. Volunteering is a way to take a step back from that. See a need, gather friends, and change the world. Changing someone's world. It happens now. This is the time. And this is when you learn, so why not start? Are you a young volunteer making a difference? Apply for the Prudential Spirit of Community Award. Visit spirit.prudential.com. Okay, so Sarah. Yeah, where information is power. If you just tuned in, we are on with Kristen Mitchell, Fatherless Girls, and I'm your host, Dr. Sheba Holly on Talks with Sheba. So, you know, when we lack those fathers, we tend to be the dumping ground for all of the not-so-wonderful men. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, some women who grew up without that father presence, they are able to, you know, compartmentalize that and, and lead lives that aren't... Um, uh, toxic, right? And then some of us <laughs> aren't so lucky, right. you know? And I think it just depends on how we as people are able to deal with setbacks of of, of life. And, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit off air about how um, the men that we attract in our lives and the men that we, we deal with and even some of the decision-making that mm -hmm. we as women engage in. And I talk about this in my workshops with regard to self-esteem, how uh, some women are able to allow certain things from men. Mm -hmm. And it's oftentimes the root of it is, is something relating to our, our childhood and our past experiences. And I think that when we've never uh, received that love from our father, we're longing to be loved. We're longing um, to have someone not abandon us. Right. And so you asked me about abandonment earlier, and I think that when a father is not in a, their child's life, that is a sense of abandonment. Because as a child, <clears throat> you feel as if your, your father has left you. You feel as if your father has abandoned you for whatever the reason. You know, for, for my case, my father was incarcerated, and so that was the reason he was not there. But, and, I, and I rationalized that. I said, okay, he's not here because he can't be here, not mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to be here. And I spoke about that in the book. Right. What I couldn't make sense of is when he came home, why he still wasn't there. You know, and so in that sense, you do feel abandoned, and you do feel like something or someone was more important than me. And so for that reason, my father chose not to be in my life. That's how you kind of internalize that. And so when you meet that man, and that man leaves you, Right, mm -hmm. man is unfaithful to you. You feel abandoned all over again. So the question becomes, to whom am I important? Right. And that was something I struggled with for a long time, and I, I spoke about that in depth in the book as well. You know, to whom is Kristen important? To whom does Kristen matter? Because here I am looking at the men in my life, and I'm feeling as if I, I wasn't that important to any of them because they all left. 
Right, right. My daddy, <clears throat> and I say that um, that way for a reason, my daddy put me on a pedestal. I was his everything. There was nothing I can do wrong with you when I did, it, did something wrong. He made it right. Mm -hmm. It, it could have been horrible. <laughs> he made it right. And it, to my surprise, I found out later on in life that he was not my biological father. He did adopt me. So wow. I had his last name, you know. And they say if they feed you enough, you start looking like them. Yes. <laughs> and they would always say I look just like them. Wow. Um, it, so when he passed away, he passed away when I was 19, and that's when I felt like, oh, wow, what am I to do? Because he would always tell me, you're my retirement plan. I'm putting all of me into you so you can take care of me when I'm old. And I'm going to drive you crazy like you drove me crazy. <coughs> you know, so I had that sense of loss, and I didn't know where to go. However, I still had a biological father that I didn't really, I knew who he was because he was around my family. Okay. Weird. He was always around but I didn't know he was my father. Okay, so I guess that was an arrangement. Um, and I didn't attach myself. I said, oh, well, I already had the daddy I wanted, so thanks for no cigar. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I mean, and that was as an adult. Mm -hmm. And when I went to him, he had other children. And when I went to him and asked for things daughters would ask, their fathers of, which my, I knew my daddy would make it happen, no matter what, um, he said, yeah, well, um, I have to take care of XYZ because she needs me, and um, maybe next time. And these were my words. There won't be a next time. And I meant it, and it wasn't a next time. And when I think about relationships, I'm like, oh, wow, where, why do I have these type of relationships when I didn't feel like I was a fatherless daughter? But, uh, but in, in some regards, I would argue that you were, you know, and when, when we talk about fatherless daughters, and I, I read this somewhere, um, I think maybe even Ayala Banza talked about it, but um, fatherless daughter doesn't just mean um, your father was absent altogether and you didn't know who he was, mm -hmm. right? Your father could have been in the home, but <clears throat> he worked all the time, so mm -hmm. he wasn't physically there a lot. Your father could have been in the home, but he was not emotionally um, attached. attached to you, you know? Or your father could have just not been there at all. Your father could have been in the home, but he didn't provide financially, and so he left your mother and, and you destitute to some degree. You know, so I think when we talk about fatherless daughters, we talk about the absence of a father in some capacity, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and even with your situation, although you had the daddy that you knew to be your daddy, when he passed away and even when you found out that he was not your biological father there's still some part of you that yearns to to figure out why was my biological father not there why did he not step up to the plate why did this man have to step in his place you know i have a stepfather who i call my father and uh he and my mother have been together for years and i talk about that in the book as well and I identify with him as my father because he has been there for so long and because he has been there when I've needed him. And so, but despite the fact that we do have an amazing relationship, he is not my biological father. Do you understand what I'm saying? I totally do. And so, you know, I love him to death. He would be, he would walk me down the aisle at my wedding, you know. But um, there is something to be said about a child's attachment, not only to her, her father, but to her mother as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a, um, a reader who read the book, and, and she messaged me, and she said, oh, my God, your story resonated with me. She said, but my father raised me. My mother was who was not there. Wow. You know, and so I love this book because it allows people from all different places to be connected by some commonality. We may not have gone through the exact same thing, but there's something in this book for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found in writing it. Initially, I didn't even write it with men in mind. I wrote it with <laughs> women in mind. I wanted to help women right. who were going through the same or similar things as myself. But just so happened that, you know, of course, men read the book, and they were touched by it. And so I was like, oh, maybe they get it. You know, and you'd be surprised how many men 
just don't realize the importance of their presence in their child's life. Mm -hmm. As simple as a concept as that that is, you'd be surprised how many men just don't know. They they know about sons, but they think the girls are left for the mothers. For the mothers. Mm -hmm. And and I always think about, I say, you know, um, we as, as women, like, where would we learn how a man is supposed to treat us? Where would we learn how a man is supposed to love us? Where would we learn how we're supposed to um, love our men if our fathers don't teach us or if we don't have good examples of that in the home. And so I think that <clears throat> it's incumbent upon us, those of us who have, you know, gone through this journey or those of us who have experienced not having that love from a father to kind of reach back out to other uh, women who haven't gotten to that place yet where they can accept that their father isn't present or where they can even accept that they have issues regarding the absence of their father because some of us like to pretend it doesn't matter to us. And that was me for a very long time. Yeah, I totally get that because I have had um, messages from my mother that said, oh, I, I spoke to your father and he asked how was his daughter that doesn't like him. I said, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not that I don't like him. It's like I didn't open myself to learn more about him or know him to like him. And I understand that all too well. For for um, I was very resistant to, to building a relationship with my father at a point because I just felt like, you know, at this point, I mean, we've gone all these years without having a relationship, so I sure don't need one now, <laughs> you know. That's, that's how I felt, but... When I when I realized that okay Chris like you you really do have issues with the fact that your father wasn't there maybe you should sit down and, and have a conversation with him mm-hmm. um, and so we did that I think that that the difficulty becomes when people are resistant to own their wrongs mm-hmm. right and so it becomes very difficult to kind of forge a relationship when you have people who aren't at a place where they can accept what it is that they've done in the past and and I think that. The only uh, way to positively move forward is to acknowledge the wrongs that were done in the past. And and, uh, so that's our our struggle. But I would say that we're we're struggling through that. And hopefully, you know, we'll be able to have um, a solid relationship, a father and daughter relationship. So Definitely. And we're going to talk more about the relationship side of it also and the types of men that we tend to gravitate towards or gravitate towards us. Yes. <laughs> I feel like they're coming towards me like little asteroids. <laughs> oh, don't mind me. I'm a little, <laughs> a little off, but it, it just seems that way when um, you don't know how to combat or figure out the root cause mm-hmm. to an issue. Mm-hmm. But when we return... Saved by the bell. Up next. (laughs) Okay, so Sarah, I'm dropping you off at Emily's. Yep. And Josh, you're going to? Soccer, Dad. Soccer practice. Right. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know when I pick you both up, I'll be wearing my short shorts. What? No! Yep. And my dorky dad hat, and I'm going to do my dad dance for all your friends. They'll love it. Seriously? Why? Because I like my short shorts. Of course, I could be talked out of it if you guys would just buckle up your seatbelts without giving me a hard time. It's important to get your kids to buckle up for safety, no matter what it takes. And sometimes, all it takes is your parental powers of persuasion. Okay, okay, we're buckling up. See, I'll buckle up. Good choice. I'll just have to do my dad dance at dinner time. What? What? No! Do what you have to to make sure your kids are wearing. And we're back with Kristen Mitchell. Kristen, what about those guys we choose? (laughs) (laughs) You you know, I'm still working on that because uh, my mother... She jokes with me all the time. She's she's sitting right here. And she knows I like my men a little older, right? Mm-hmm. And so some people argue that that's me, again, looking for that father figure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I still haven't figured that part out. You know, I it's think true. I'm just attracted to older <laughs> men. It's true, it's true. <laughs> Psychologically, in those textbooks, it's true. It's true according to yes. the textbooks, right? Yes. But I, I do think, and... and 
in the therapy that I've gone through, and, and my best friend Kia and I, we talk about this all the time, um, we, we talk about how a lot of things in our adulthood are remnants from our, our childhood and our past. So even the, a lot of times when, when negative things happen in our childhood, we try to write them as adults. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes they say we uh, look for our father in the men that we date. And even men look for their mother in the women that they date. And if you had a broken relationship with your father as a child, the theory is that you look for a man, very subconsciously again, that is similar to your father when you're an adult so that you can repair that broken relationship. Now, that's what a therapist told me, which, you know, makes sense, and and there's some, certainly some validity to that. And so I think that being said, a lot of time we do look for um, our men to, to, to have certain characteristics of our father, even if we do it as a very subconscious act. And the funny part is, mm-hmm. when they exhibit some of those same characteristics of our parent that we don't like, we get upset. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, but that's what we looked for, right? Without even realizing it, right? And so I'm wondering, in your in your adult life, have mm-hmm. you noticed that you have um, been in relationships with men who mirrored in some way your father? Yes, and a lot of times their birthdays were near his. Really? Um, they had the same build, possibly the same style, because he was very, um, my daddy was very um, stylish. I just had an, uh, an epiphany, uh, or I don't know what you call it, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is crazy. We're educated. <laughs> After all this time, I didn't, until you just said that, no lie, I promise to God, my ex and my dad's birthday are the exact same month, mm-hmm. probably like 10 days from each other, mm-hmm. right? And one, one of the, the issues that led to my ex and I's uh, I, uh, demise is the same character flaw, if you will, that my father has. Right. And I literally, I just realized that. And and so with my ex-husband, my last, um, I don't know what you call it, affair, relationship, what do you call that? <laughs> um, yeah, they were just too similar. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. you know, it's like daddy right mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. It was interesting. Um, but at the same time, there was some good out of each. Absolutely. When I think about it, um, like my ex-husband, he he told me, well, if you want to get ahead, you have to do X, Y, Z. You worked here and here, but what do you know? What type of education do you have? I went back to school, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I didn't stop. Mm-hmm. Went straight through four degrees. Mm-hmm. Um, so I always accredit him to really bringing that to light for me mm-hmm. because it was a turning point. Mm-hmm. Um, with my last relationship, it, he told me there was nothing that I couldn't do. Mm-hmm. And that was something my father used to tell me and would push me out. And he would push me out there to do, just that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. He would push me out to do whatever. And, and I think there's always good there's in, always in relationships. Good. That, and, and my ex, Lenny, he was the same way, you know, very supportive. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever it is that I, I wanted to do or said that I wanted to do, um, he he was very supportive of it and very encouraging. Mm-hmm. And I believe that all of it was genuine, you know. And so I think that even when God places people in our lives, even if there are some negatives that come from it, I think there's always something positive that we can take from it. We may not be able to see the positive in that moment. <laughs> but, but yeah, there's always a lesson. Yeah, I think once you've healed from it, you're mm-hmm. totally able to see. Not only that, it's when you encounter someone. The reason why they're there, because we have life contracts. Mm. The reason why they're there is to teach you a lesson. And once you learn that lesson, it never occurs again. Mm. So Once you learn the lesson. Wh- but you have to recognize what the lesson mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. And, and actually correct. Mm-hmm. Self-correct. Um, so that's why I truly believe there's there's always some good in a situation that looks horrible. Yeah. Always. I just told my, my mom that, and I, we were just talking off air, too, and I said, people think when they read the book that this happened a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Did it? It's not far removed at all. Um, the last psychiatric stint, uh, I was in Virginia Hospital Center, and I talk about that in the book, of course, and um, this was the April before last. So this has not even been two full years. 
And so I was telling my mom before we came on air, I said, you know, it's amazing how when we were in the hospital, I said we were in the hospital because she was at the hospital every day. That's right. Bringing me lunch, talking to the other patients. You're her favorite girl. I'm her favorite girl. (laughs) Her only girl. Her only girl. (laughs) Her favorite girl. And she, you know, she endured that with me. And I, I talked about that in the book. And I was telling her, I said, Mom, it's crazy. I said, because... At the time, I was like, Kristen, like, you're a loser. Like, I was saying all these negative things mm. to myself, and my and my best friend calls them ants. And um, I said, I could not believe I was in this place, and I didn't understand why this was happening to me. And being here today, doing some of the other interviews that I've done, it all makes sense, and it all comes full circle. Yes. Yeah, so with, to learn more about you, you do a lot of things. So I want to put your website out there, yeah. Mitchell dot com Kristen L Mitchell dot com you gotta put the L oh gotta put the L you know I never saw the L that's really? weird yes. yeah so Kristen and that is K R I S T I N L yep. Mitchell dot com please take a look at this website she has so much going on uh, quickly could you tell us about Save by the Bell class series yeah um, I love Save by the Bell Save by the Bell is a class series that I created and it's basically meant to again um, help women to overcome some of the obstacles that <clears throat> they're faced with. And I actually did um, one that turned out really successful um, at a therapist's office. And we had some of her clients come in. We had some other women come in. And, again, this is true to who I am as an educator. Mm-hmm. And so I do a full lesson. And I do the lesson on one of the platforms that I spoke about uh, in my book. So either fathers, daughters, depression, um, self-esteem, those types of, of issues are the issues that I bring forth in those workshops. Um, I give information on cognitive distortions and, and how they can lead to depressive episodes. I also um, give information on how to challenge those distortions and how to um, bring yourself out of that that dark uh, bout of depression. And so we talk about those things. We talk about how uh, your decision-making affects your life outcomes. We talk about self-esteem. All of these issues we bring forth in the Saved by the Bell class series. Um, I had another more intimate one um, at my mother's house, and we talked about domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And and we talked about that uh, not because I've been um, a victim of domestic violence, but because I am aware that Self-esteem plays a huge part in why a woman woman chooses to stay in that type of um, environment, as well as being a fatherless daughter. You know, so I tie my platforms into that one as well, because I think that they're very closely related. You also have a line of T-shirts, He Wasn't My Daddy Tees. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. Those T-shirts are, again, everything is centered around the themes in my book. Yes. So um, I have one that speaks to uh, depression, of course, Mm -hmm. and I love that T-shirt. It's Break Free from Mental Illness. And um, there's a woman who is behind bars, and I thought that that was such an adequate way to describe what depression feels like. feels like you're imprisoned, Mm -hmm. but in your own body and in your own mind. Um, I have another one that is a fatherless daughter's T. <clears throat> and I have another one that's a promiscuity tea, which mm. speaks to respecting yourself and having right. that high self-esteem that we speak about. So those T-shirts are available um, online as well. And if com is too much to remember, then you can use uh, hewasn'tmydaddy.com. It'll direct you to the same site. Awesome. www.hewasn'tmydaddy.com. You know, I just want to thank you, Kristen, for coming on with us today. Um, I'm sure there's someone out there that's in pain that your book will help. Your Saved by the Bell classes, class series will help. You know, um, and I just commend you for being so brave. Thank you. And I have to say, I had such a great time with you (laughs) on and off air. And I am so thankful for um, having the opportunity to come and speak with you. And I, too, I wish you continued success. Um, we're both educators at heart, yes. and it's so amazing to see you taking your platform and just running with it. And I and I said in my book, I said, you know, love who you are, rock with that. And so, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes. Welcome. Well, it's a wrap for us on this spectacular Sunday. Thanks for hanging out with us, and thank you, Kristen, www.kristenlmitchell.com. And remember, 
Work like you don't need the money. Love like you've never been hurt. And dance like nobody's looking. We'll talk later. With Shiva. Be empowered. WOL Washington. WPRS HD2 Waldorf. WKYS HD2 Washington. WMMJ HD2 Bethesda. Celebrating 35 years of service to the community where information is power. As I went through.